Nobody ever wants to see a player get hurt. But for South Carolina in 2023, there are five particular players they especially don't need to go down with an injury. You are Locked On Gamecocks, your daily podcast on the South Carolina Gamecocks, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, Gamecock Nation, and welcome back to the Locked On Gamecocks Podcast. I'm Andrew Lyon, the host of this podcast, and you can find my written work over on Gamecocks Digest on SI.com. Thank you for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your first listen or watch for your team every day. We are free and available both on YouTube and wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. Today's show is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Go to birddogs.com slash college or enter the promo code LOCKEDONCOLLEGE for a free white tech hat with any purchase. You won't want to take your Bird Dogs off. We can promise you that. South Carolina heading into the 2023 football season. There are certain positions where the Gamecocks, they feel pretty good about their depth, where they're really starting to stack up a good mixture of both experienced players and also young, talented players. But there's also some other spots where the depth, it might not be quite as good just yet. And for that reason, in my opinion, there's five particular players, five specific players on South Carolina's roster that Shane and the staff do not want to see go down with an injury in 2023. The first one that comes to mind here is Antoine Juice Wells. Now, I've made the argument before on the Lockdown Gamecocks podcast that Juice Wells is a more important player even compared to Spencer Rattler on the offensive side of the ball. And that feeling carries over to the rest of the roster as well. Juice Wells, in my opinion, he is the one receiver in this receiving core that we know he can do everything at a high level. Juice Wells has got a good combination of both size and also speed. He's got really good route running. He's extremely proficient at catching the football and also surviving contact after the catch. And... Juice Wells can also create yards after contact by breaking tackles after the catch. He's also got a lot of big game experience and the competitive fire of a number one wideout in the SEC. Something that at least in terms of the big game experience and the clutch play, no other receiver has really offered to a high degree to this point. When you're talking about big games with Antoine Juice Wells, you got to think back to about five different ones from this past season. Arkansas, Kentucky, Vanderbilt, Tennessee, and Clemson. Each of those games was a big game for South Carolina for one reason or another. And yes, I throw in Vanderbilt because I want to say that was the game right after the Missouri debacle. A game that South Carolina absolutely needed as a bounce-back victory type of game. Now, South Carolina, as we will discuss more in detail later on in the show, they're going to be playing five top 25 teams this year. Three of those teams, by the way, are ranked in the top 10, and four of these games against these opponents are going to be taking place away from williams Bryce Stadium. The point being, South Carolina... They're going to have even more big matchups on the schedule this coming fall. So this offense really needs Antoine Juice Wells to be out there on the field and be healthy because he is quite literally a game changer for this Gamecock offense. If Juice Wells goes down with an injury, to be quite honest right now, there's just no other receiver in this receiving core that we know of that can do everything that he can do at the level he does. So for that reason, I think Antoine Juice Wells, he is the number one player that Shaper and the staff would not want to see go down with an injury. Now, number two on my list, I'm going to go to the trenches, and I'm going to go with offensive tackle Ja'Kai Moore. Now, out of everyone that I'm going to talk about on today's show, this is probably the most obvious selection here, because Ja'Kai Moore... He's already bumping out to offensive tackle because of what happened to his teammate. 
Jalen Nichols because Nichols suffered a significant lower body injury back in the spring game in April. And Ja'Kai Moore is the only offensive lineman on this roster that has Power 5 starting experience at that left tackle position. Nick Gargiulo has played left tackle himself in his college football career, but the thing is Nick Gargiulo played left tackle in the Ivy League, and that's not to say that there isn't good football in the Ivy League, but obviously, from an athleticism standpoint, it does not even compare to the SEC. And if the staff was more comfortable putting Nick Gargiulo there at left tackle, they probably would have already done so. He probably would be playing left tackle in fall camp practices right now. But at least based on what the media has been able to see so far, Nick Gargiulo is slotted at left guard, while Ja'Kai Moore is slotted at left tackle. So that answers that question. Jackson Hughes, the Charlotte transfer, he has played left tackle as well. But he played left tackle at Charlotte, as I just mentioned, in the group of five at the FBS level. And I just don't think that his skill set fits quite well enough at that left tackle position compared to the right tackle spot. So my overall point with Ja'Kai Moore here is if Ja'Kai Moore were to go down with an injury, no matter who you put there, the player that takes his place or that would take his place in that scenario, they would be in unfamiliar territory in some way, shape, or form. So if you're South Carolina, you certainly don't want to see Antoine Juice Wells go down with an injury. But behind Juice Wells, there's no doubt in my mind that Ja'Kai Moore is number two on this list of players. Now we're going to continue our conversation regarding players that Shane Beamer and his staff would not want to see go down with an injury. Who are some of the other guys where if they were to go down, it would be detrimental for their position group and this football team as a whole. We'll dive into each of those guys in just a couple of moments. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Football season is about to kick off, and FanDuel is going to give you the chance to win all season long. Because right now, when you bet on a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every time that team wins in the regular season. Just pick any team to win the Super Bowl, and you'll get bonus bets for every victory. It is that easy. The Carolina Panthers, I did not bring them up on yesterday's show, but they are currently listed at plus 6,000 odds to win the Super Bowl. Obviously, not that great compared to some of these other teams, but hey, crazy things have happened in the NFL. And if you pick the Carolina Panthers and the Panthers win throughout the regular season, you could use some of your bonus bets on spreads, player props, over-unders, and much, much more. So visit FanDuel.com slash LockedOnCollege and start earning bonus bets with America's number one sportsbook. That's FanDuel.com slash Locked on. Welcome back to this Thursday edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast. We cover your South Carolina Gamecocks every single day. Thank you, as always, to all of you every day for making the Locked On Gamecocks podcast your daily choice for South Carolina Gamecock sports coverage. If you would like to become an everydayer of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, then you can feel free to subscribe on YouTube and click the bell for future alerts and notifications, or you can give us a follow wherever you get your audio podcasts daily. All right, let's talk about a few more players that Shane Beamer and the staff would not want to see go down with some sort of injury or ailment in the 2023 football season. For number three on my list, I've got edge rusher Jordan Strawn. Now, Jordan Strawn is slotted here based on a few different factors. The talent that he has, the experience that he offers, and the lack of proven depth at this position. In regards to the talent, a lot of people forget that just three years ago, Jordan Strawn led the FBS in sacks while he was at Georgia State. He then had three more sacks that he added to his career total in 2021, where he was serving <clears throat> when he was serving in more of a rotational when he was playing in more of a rotational role here at South Carolina. And then heading into 2022, Jordan Strawn had had a great offseason. He was taking over as the starter at the edge rusher position after Kingsley and Ekbari had moved on to the NFL. And unfortunately, really bad luck 
took place in the Arkansas game as he tore that ACL, and it took him out, of course, for the rest of the season. But Jordan Strahd, when he is fully healthy, or at least right around 100%, he is one of the most talented pass rushers on this entire defensive line for South Carolina. And the experience factor is also something to take into account here. Jordan Strahd, he's about to go into his seventh season in college football. I can't recall the last time that happened or if that has ever happened at South Carolina. I'm not going to act like I know, but again, I've heard about some sixth year seniors. South Carolina had plenty of those guys on the 2022 squad. I don't know anybody that stayed here for seven years. So if anybody thinks of a, a former player that has been here seven years, throw them down in the comment section on YouTube or shoot me a message on Twitter. And then you've got the lack of proven depth here at this edge rusher position because there is some promising talent behind Jordan Stroud. I'm certainly not making it out like the cupboard is bare. But the thing is, Sterling Lucas and Clayton White, the rest of this coaching staff, they've yet to use those ingredients in that cupboard and try to mix them together to put a meal together. So you don't know what you're going to get because you haven't gotten enough of a large sample size of some of these guys. The most proven player, in my opinion, out of this group is Jatias Gear, who transferred in from Syracuse this offseason. He started 12 games for the Orange last year and recorded 33 total tackles, 6.5 tackles for loss, and 3.5 and sacks. And right now, he's running with the second string defensive line behind Jordan Strawn in practice. So... We'll see if some of these other guys continue to step up. I have heard some of the coaches talk about Tyree Johnson. Shane Beamer specifically mentioned his name at South Carolina's Media Day event. Brian Thomas Jr. got thrown out of someone that has really gotten after it this offseason, according to Clayton White himself. So some of these guys have taken a step forward from what we have heard. But again, we still got to see that play out on the football field. So for that reason... I got George Strine listed at number three on this list of players that South Carolina would not want to see go down with an injury. At number four, I've got cornerback Marcellus Dial. Marcellus Dial, he's got a similar set of reasons for why South Carolina would not want to see him go down with an injury compared to Jordan Strine. But there is one key difference here. Marcelo Style, he is a veteran on this defense, not just in terms of the college experience that he offers. Everybody knows that. But he also now is a third-year player in Clayton White's defensive system specifically. And Marcel Style, he's only one of three scholarship defensive backs on this roster that is going into his third season in this program and in this system subsequently. So, in my opinion, that is a big deal because you lose guys like Cam Smith and Darius Rush. South Carolina, they need to have somebody step up and take the mantle, so to speak. I'm not saying that that means Marcel Style has got to play up to the level of a second-round draft pick, but they certainly need him to lead the charge, at least at that corner position. And I think that Marcel Style is ready for that challenge. He has started 17 games already for the Gamecocks over the past two seasons, and that leads the entire cornerback room and the secondary as a whole. But the other key thing here with Marcel Style and why it would be imperative for this team to see him remain healthy this year is the fact that the death behind them, again, you've got some promising pieces, just like the edge position, but nobody's proven behind this starting line. You've got quarterbacks like Judge Collier and Vakari Swain, two true freshmen who, so far, they seem to be doing a pretty good job. Judge Collier actually took some second team reps in the team portion of South Carolina's practice back on Monday that the media was in attendance for. So it seems like that the South Carolina native from Rock Hill is coming along quite well in terms of his development. Quarterback Vakari Swain. I think Vakari Swain could be an absolute star in this secondary under Touring Gray's watch. But he just got here on campus just a couple months ago. He did not go through spring practice with the team. And so Vicari Swain's not just trying to catch up in terms of just his physical stature, but he's also got to catch up in terms of his playbook knowledge. So I think it will take up just a little bit of time, but I do think Vicari Swain's got a good chance to see himself sort of elevated up on that depth chart in the future. Cornerback Isaiah Norris, he's now also been in the program for three years, but again, 
We've only seen him really play in some spot duty opportunities to this point, and we just don't know how he would handle being out there on the field for a significant portion of a football game against a good team. And then you got cornerback Emery Floyd, a guy that I think probably is a much better coverage corner than anything else. He's a track guy too, so he's got good speed, which can help him out if he's a little bit behind his man that he is covering in a one-on-one situation. But the point being, none of these guys have played in really big games like Marcel Style has. So if Marcel Style were to go down with an injury, that would be trouble for South Carolina's cornerback position, in my opinion. And the last guy that I think South Carolina would not want to see get hurt this season, this might surprise some people, but I've got punter Kai Kroger listed here at number five. And my reasoning is simple. Kai Kroger... Yes, he is a punter on this team, but he is an absolute game changer for the Gamecocks. Anyone who watched Kai Kroger play last year would know that to the nth degree. He was a first-team All-American according to multiple different media outlets. He averaged 46.1 yards on 58 total punts this past fall. He downed half of his punts inside the opponent's 20-yard line. That is an absurd ratio to have in terms of that statistical category. Kai Kroger, though, has also become sort of a folk hero in South Carolina's fan base because of the things he does outside of just punting the football. Specifically, what he has done on trick plays. He has had six career passes to this point. He's completed each and every pass for 173 total passing yards and three touchdowns. Kai Kroger is an absolute weapon for the Gamecocks in more ways than one. He could completely change field position for the opponent or through, again, some trickery that's dialed up by Pete Lembo and Shane Beamer, he can help the Gamecocks either stay on the field or even score some points, which can end up being the difference in some of these football games, and it was, especially this past season. So, I know that some of you might be sitting there and saying, Andrew, come on now. He's the putter. I mean, what, besides pulling a hammy, what, what could he do to hurt himself? Well, Kai Kroger did have a foot injury going into fall camp this past year. I believe that he suffered it while he was back at home, either in Illinois or Indiana. So, you know, this stuff can happen when it comes to these specialists. And for Kai Kroger, if he were to go down... I think it would really have a massive negative impact on South Carolina's football team. I really and truthfully do. So for that reason, I've got Kai Kroger closing out the list at number five in terms of players that this staff would not want to see go down with an injury in 2023. Now, all these guys, they're going to obviously be very important for this team. And another reason why that's going to be the case is because, as I mentioned earlier, This is a very difficult schedule that the South Carolina Gamecocks are going to be facing in 2023. And some of my colleagues over at Locked On, they took their crack at ranking the top 25 teams in college football heading into the season. And the numbers, yeah, they back up what I just said about South Carolina's schedule difficulty. We're going to dive into that a little bit deeper in just a few moments. Today's show is brought to you by Bird Dogs. Now, I know that for a lot of you, you know, the main thing with your clothes is you want to feel comfortable. You get to a certain age where, honestly, you don't care really what kind of brand it might be. You might not care about sort of how flashy it is. You just want something that you know is going to work well for you. And Bird Dogs is just the pair of pants or shorts that can help to fit all of your needs. If you go to birddogs.com slash college right now and enter the promo code LockedOnCollege, you get a free white tech hat with your order of whatever shorts that you end up buying. That's birddogs.com slash college or the promo code LockedOnCollege for a free white tech hat. Again, you're not going to want to take your bird dogs off once you put them on. We can promise you that for sure. Welcome back to today's edition of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast, where we cover your team every single day in just 30 minutes. 
A lot of these preseason polls are starting to roll out as we get closer and closer to the beginning of the 2023 college football season. And all of us college hosts over at the Locked On Podcast Network, we decide, you know what? Why don't we put together our own top 25 preseason poll? And so that is exactly what we ended up doing earlier this week. And we released it, I believe, just yesterday morning. And as far as the top 25 goes from Locked On, well, a lot of South Carolina's opponents landed in this poll. In particular, Georgia was slotted at number one. Clemson was slotted eighth. Tennessee was slotted 13th. North Carolina was slotted 17th somehow. And the Texas A&M Aggies snuck in there at number 20. If you want to talk about SEC teams specifically, besides the ones I've already mentioned, Alabama was slotted at number four, LSU was slotted at number six, and Ole Miss was slotted at number 21. And that pretty much does it for this top 25. So, a couple of my takeaways here. South Carolina, based on Locked On's top 25 preseason poll, They are playing five of the top 25 teams in college football heading into this year. Four of those games are going to be away from williams Bryce Stadium. The only game against all these top 25 teams that South Carolina is going to be playing at home this year is going to be against the Clemson Tigers. That is just brutal. That is such a really bad draw for That is just a brutal draw for Shane Beamer and South Carolina. The fact that the majority of their toughest opponents they're going to face all year, and they got to play most of them. The fact that they got to play the majority of their toughest opponents this year on the road, especially in the case of in the SEC. Gosh almighty, stop trying to sound so smart. The fact that South Carolina's got to face the majority of their toughest opponents on the road This season, it's certainly going to make their path towards trying to progress on the field once again a lot more challenging. Now, with the rest of this portion of the show, I want to dive into a specific question for all of you. I want you all to think about it, and I'm going to also talk through this over the next couple of minutes. Where would South Carolina end up in this poll if, say, they beat North Carolina and Tennessee? Again, South Carolina to start off the season the first five weeks. They play North Carolina and Charlotte in week one. Then they come back home to play Furman in week two. Week three, they got to play at Georgia. Week four, they play Mississippi State at home. And then in week five, they go on the road to play Tennessee. I don't think South Carolina has got any chance of beating Georgia. So I'm going to leave them out of this entire scenario. But I feel very confident in South Carolina's chances to beat North Carolina. And honestly... The more time passes, the more I feel like that, you know, hey, South Carolina, they can't beat Tennessee again this fall. There is definitely a path to where they could possibly pull that off. Mississippi State, sort of the same deal as North Carolina. I just feel like that South Carolina is the better team right now, honestly. Clearly, the Bulldogs have got a lot of tragic circumstances that they're dealing with with a new coaching staff, at least in terms of their coordinators and their leadership because of what happened with Mike Leach this past winter. But I just feel like the South Carolina, they're going to get the Bulldogs there. So let's say South Carolina does start off 3-2, and two, and that includes wins over North Carolina and Tennessee. Based on this poll, where would they rank? I think it's a guarantee that South Carolina would be in the top 20. So my follow-up question would be, could they be in the top 15? I think if South Carolina is going to get in the top 15 in this scenario, it's going to fully depend on what all Tennessee has done to that point in the season. We know that Tennessee, they start off the season with a pretty soft schedule. They play Virginia, I believe, in Nashville in Week 1. And then I want to say they play Austin P in Week 2 before they play the Florida Gators on the road in Gainesville. But Florida... They're down bad right now. They just went through one of their worst seasons in the last several years in 2022. And they're replacing a top five pick at quarterback in Anthony Richardson. So you probably are imagining that Tennessee is going to win that game. And then they come back home to play UTSA. Definitely not a team that they can sleep on. But again, the Volunteers, talent-wise, they should probably beat UTSA in Knoxville. So 
there's a very good chance that Tennessee's going to be undefeated by the time they play South Carolina in Week 5. I think that makes Tennessee likely a top 10, maybe even a top 5 team, depending on what all happens in front of them. So, if that's the case, if South Carolina beats North Carolina, who, again, right now seems like a surefire top 25 team, for whatever reason, going into this season, and they take care of business against Furman and Mississippi State, I think that South Carolina could definitely find themselves squeaking their way to the top 15 heading into the bye week. And I think at the same time, that would give the team tremendous confidence. And I'm just going to go ahead and say this. I'm going to do a future show on this topic specifically, but I think it's imperative that South Carolina starts off 3-2 and two or better. I think it would be a disappointment if they did not have that kind of start to this season. If they start off 3-2, and two, again, that likely means that you're beating North Carolina and you're beating Tennessee. And if that were to happen, I think South Carolina, they would be a top 15 team, without a doubt. What are your thoughts, though, on this top 25? Do you think that South Carolina would be a top 15 team if they can knock off North Carolina and Tennessee at the start of this season? And also, who are some players that you think Shane Beamer and the staff would not want to see go down with an injury? Do you agree with my list? Or do you think that I had a glaring omission on today's show? Let me know down below in the comment section if you watch today's show on YouTube or shoot me a direct message on Twitter at a line underscore SC if you listen to today's show on an audio podcast app. But as always, thank you once again for tuning in. Have a great rest of your Thursday, and I'll be sure to catch y'all on the next show of the Locked On Gamecocks podcast.